Good afternoon all. It's an honor and my proud privilege to welcome you all on the occasion of the 14th Professor Vayan Mehra oration, which will be delivered by Professor Chakrabarti, our former head of the Department of Microbiology in PGI. So uh, we will start. Uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Akriti to welcome Professor Chakrabarti with the bouquet. Welcome our director, sir, Professor Vivek Lal, with the floor of the book. I would request our director, Professor Vivek Lal, to welcome the give his welcome address. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, welcome to this year's oration. This is, I think, the 14th uh, Professor Yashwant Nath Mehra oration, Yogendra Nath Mehra oration. And when I walked into the hall, you know, his, his face just smiled at me. This is what it was when I was his resident. It's not changed, actually. You know, I'm telling you, just kind of I thought he just came alive. He was the founding father of the department of EMT. And uh, not many know the kind of tribulations that that department had to face at that time. Because there was always an infighting, not between ENT surgeons themselves, but between ENT and other departments for space, for OTs. It didn't have the kind of exalted, uh, you know, uh, it didn't have the kind of exalted position that it occupies today, where you're also having MCH in your subject. But he fought through his, uh, all these tribulations, established the department, and we know where it stands today. Alumni from this department are the who's who across the globe. So it's uh, an honor to be here for this oration. I, as a resident, had two clear memories of Professor Vayan Mehra. And I will narrate them to tell you just how different residency was during those times from as it, it, as it is today. I once saw a patient who had a six nerve palsy. So I took him to the ENT OPD. There were no MRIs then. And uh, Professor Vayan Mehra was sitting there in the OPD and he said, rule out a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. He said, rule out a nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So we got a few tests done. We did a CSF, right? And uh, we did some X-ray, plain X-ray of the skull, whatever you used to say, Townsview or whatever. But these days, X-rays are alien to me. We go for MRI straight away. And after a week or so, I went back to him saying that we didn't get any evidence of a nasopharyngeal tumor because the CSF doesn't show a malignancy and the X-ray doesn't show any erosion, whatever that view is called. So Mera, Professor Mera looked at me. He said, with useless residents like you, you will never pick up a malignancy, even if it is coming out of their skull. So I couldn't understand what he meant. I couldn't understand what he meant. So I said, I'm not clear, sir. He said, did you see the CSF yourself? So I said, sir, I didn't see the CSF myself. I, sent, I did the CSF and I sent it across and I got a negative report. If you cannot value your own patient CSF, you have no business to be in PGI. You have no business to be in PGI. I mean, that was the kind of commitment that was expected at that time. That was the kind of commitment at that time, which was expected out of a resident. So, of course, just a nostalgic memory for me. He succumbed to CML when he was admitted in the VIP ward. I used to go there. His son is also Vivek, if I'm not wrong. He has a son, Vivek. And I used to meet him regularly. And this year's oration is going to be given by my neighbor, Professor Aruna Loki Chakramarti, whom I never met. We had shared a common wall. We never met. And he disappeared after retirement. But I'm glad to see that he understands the value of having part of the sannyas in PGI also. So welcome, Dr. Arnaluke Chakravarti. I'm happy that you have PGI ko bhi ek dham samjha. Okay? Ye dham hai, ye sabse bada dham ye hai. So kripya karke, aap hiya aate rahi aur hamko guide karte rahi hai. With that, I welcome you all to this oration. Thank you. 
thank you sir thank you so much uh, our dean sir has joined us uh, kindly welcome professor rakesh shaigal with us okay. so now i would uh, like to call upon professor naresh panda uh, head of the department of department of hotel rheumatology and head neck surgery to share his journey with professor mehra professor aruna lok chakravarti today's orator professor vivek lal director pgi professor rakesh sagal dean pgi uh, former uh, director professor sk sharma uh professor behra professor arke suri madam suri deputy director administration mr kumar gorov uh, and kumar abhay our financial advisor faculty members and dear friends um as professor vivek lal just said you know, professor mehra was a very hard task master it was very difficult to satisfy him and the only way to satisfy him was working like him and believe me he used to work 14 hours a day he will probably the first one to come to pgi and he had a toyota corolla those days when i came in 1984 and those garages which you see 10 of them in in front and he will come exactly at 7:30 7:35 walk his way to his office and then from his office he would put on uh, his apron i don't know he will never wear a shirt those days air conditioners are not there they will put it over his way over their vest and then walk into like a dawn he will walk into the ward exactly at 8 o'clock if he is not coming at 801 if by that time if he has not come that means he is not coming that was the level of punctuality he had the journey which which we saw as regards the detection of fungus is again 38 years old and professor chakravarti would agree with me that it was one of the rounds in 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 our in our daily morning rounds where me and my another colleague of mine who was we are waiting for the thesis topic and uh, he was always after sir sir mera thesis topic kya hoga he will say oh i am i am looking at it he was a great thinker and in one of the extra pns we didn't have ct scan we didn't have mri and he had a look and he said what are these whitish shadows within that black opacity what is this so he said i feel you know we need to we need to investigate this what exactly is this material why this happened so he told you know i'll i'll talk to madam pushpa talwar he told us and okay we'll we'll discuss about it and after the next or i think one week later he called my friend uh, prabhaka he is a senior consultant in vijayawada now and told uh, you know we used to do those antral washouts uh, in our opd it was a opd procedure using a trocar cannula ent friends will understand and then you know the washouts will come collected in a kidney tray and sent you know nothing just is to be thrown into the dustbin so he said you know you collect the entire material and send it for uh, you know ko smear so that was when 38 years back the journey the foundation of the fungal disease for which professor aruna lok chakravarti is known to have carried it for 38 years and is a, is is a master in the field started in one of the rounds where we did not know anything about the fungal disease those days we just did not know all anything fungus used to be called as fungal granuloma and we have progressed we have tried to you know categorize and he has taken it too far which he would be talking in his oration the second best thing in dr mehra was that he will be putting you at ease i remember when when i was trying to enter into the portals of pga in august 1984 we were called blue star batch i saw pallab dr pallab entering uh, we were two months late and our you know entrance was held probably on the 5th the results were declared on the 6th of august and um, you know i applied for we, we were given the choice of two subjects so we i applied in surgery and i applied in ent second choice and uh, i went to surgery and and did fairly badly so badly that you know dr kuldeep singh asked me if there was a ca breast case and us Uh, okay uh, tell me and i was really elated that you know i am a master in ca breast because you know that was a good case 
he asked me about okay okay you know no about chemotherapy of carcinoma breast and i was completely floored i said sorry sir um, i haven't read in detail and you know after knowing that i have not read in detail he asked me another question on chemotherapy of breast and i knew my fate so i i i said then he said go and i thought in my mind that sir i'll i just thought that sir i'll come back again for surgery because that was my primary choice to become a general surgeon so you know and that time the registrar's uh, you know operation blue star it was all army all around so the registrar man was there and said aapko ent mein aapne apply kiya na apne niche chaliye mere sath wahan wait kar rahe hain dr mehra so i went i was really scared that you know i i entered the room dr mehra and dr man were sitting and i thought that you know they were waiting all the other candidates we, they used to call five times the number of seats so nine candidates were already examined so they were waiting for me and the moment he i mean saw me he said young man where were you so i said sir uh, i had gone for surgery viva okay so surgery is your first choice i said yes sir how did it go very bad sir so okay so but ent is not your choice i said sir it's my second choice i haven't i haven't done well in ent uh, in surgery so so he asked me if you are selected would you join i said sir i'll i'll consider so he asked me and then there was a clinical case he told one of uh, our seniors professor achal gulati who was conducting the the spotters and i did finish my spotters and then i came for the viva i was given uh, malignancy yeah and with unknown primary and i did very well and i could know from his face that probably i'll i'll get the seat i knew i had that intuition so i joined and then uh, it was it was really a great great journey it was a real great journey because he had that mastery he was such a great motivator inspirational figure you know you you would know when you enter his room he would know the purpose for which you have entered his room you know if you are going for leave he will just not look at you and if you have gone for uh, say you know for some work for patient related he said narish batao kya hai so like that you know that he he was a master reader of minds had a great sense of humor also our seniors told us that one uh, a senior resident he was wanting to do mch in neurosurgery so he was very scared to go to dr mehra So, so ultimately he he approached dr mehra and told sir uh, i want to do mch in neurosurgery so you know he had that habit of doing like this and he said okay if pus can go from the ear to the brain so can you <laughs> go and do your mch and he ultimately did his mch and went to us and and became a a, a great neurosurgeon he was such a, a visionary that you know way back when cochlear implants were introduced in 1982 the first commercial cochlear implant was available uh, in 1982 and 1985 sir thought of having a, a workshop on cochlear implants there was a group in germany called wanfi who were into you know making a prototype europeans most of the times compete with the americans and uh, you know they were trying to make their own prototype after william house had made a single channel cochlear implant in 78 was commercially available in 82 and um, you know this uh, they were trying to do it sir called their people and then audiologists and we were told do all that what is the insertion how do you do it all junior residents there were only two senior residents we just you know were made to present we were we were not so lucky that we didn't couldn't start our cochlear implant program but nevertheless when we did our first cochlear implant program in 2003 with the help of uh, professor mohan kameshwaran from chennai um, you know you could see the the smile on his face and he told me i knew naresh you know we will do it one day and then we have done it so that was uh, professor mehra sir um, you know and uh, he uh, his wife mrs mehra is a very affectionate lady even today every year she she thinks about the department she would contribute uh, to the department fund every year and that's the affection which has she has been showing on us um, you know talking to us you know off and on so with this um, thank you very much we miss you sir and uh, i'm sure uh, uh, professor chakravarti when he gives his oration 
we'll talk about what you what you thought uh, 38 years back thank you very much thank you sir for sharing your experiences and journey with professor mehra uh, now i would like to call upon uh, professor jaymanti bakshi to introduce the orator for our evening professor anuloke chakravarti Good afternoon, everyone. It's my proud privilege to introduce the orator for today's in Professor Vyan Mehra Oration, who is no other than Professor Arunalok Chakravarti. And all of us sitting in this hall today know him very well, and he is known world all over the world for his extensive work in microbiology and especially on the fungal pathogenesis and fungal diseases. So I will tell briefly about Sir. Uh, currently, he is. director of uh, dudadhari barfani hospital and research institute at haridwar and he is former professor and head department of medical microbiology at pgi mr chandigarh sir did his mbbs from uh, medical college calcutta in 1981 and he did his md in medical microbiology from pgi mr chandigarh in 1985 and diploma of national boards in medical microbiology in 1987 sir has many fellowships to his credits and he is the fellow of national academy of medical sciences india since 2007 fellow of national academy of sciences india fellow of infectious diseases society of america since 2013 and he is fellow of european confederation of medical mycology since 2017 he has extensive training experience before doing his md and uh, he did his rotatory internship from and housemanship from uh, calcutta medical college uh, in 1982 83 and after doing his md in pgi mr he did 3 years senior residency in pgi mr chandigarh and then he was assistant professor from uh, uh, 88 to 93 associate professor then additional professor from 97 to 2005 and he uh, became professor in uh, microbiology in pgi mr chandigarh in 2005 and he uh, was there till 30th november 2021 now sir is director of dudadhari barfani uh, hospital and research center in haridwar since 1st january 2022 onwards he has many additional trainings also he has been trained uh, by who for his work on uh, at the center for disease control in usa for his research work on fungal pathogens and he did short term course uh, on production of monoclonal antibodies from aims new delhi and he had one month training in hospital infection control program uh, from uk Uh, he has many important contributions to the research and notable among them are research on fungal rhinosinusitis uh, he formed the uh, international working group on fungal rhinosinusitis and defined the uh, uh, schema for categorization of fungal rhinosinusitis he has worked on cryptococcosis sporotrichosis paniculiosis and mycormycosis Uh, aspergillus flavus and many other fungi he developed his center at pgi mr chandigarh as national reference laboratory in medical mycology and center for advanced research in medical mycology who has recognized his center as who collaborating center for reference and research on fungi and uh, on pathogenic fungi and our center is the nodal center for antifungal uh, resistance surveillance which has been uh, designated by icmr uh, professor arunalok chakravarti had many research projects uh, he worked as principal investigators in 33 research projects in collaboration with icmr dst dbt who nih and uh, many more Uh, sir has received uh, around 20 national and international awards 
for his uh, tremendous work on uh, fungal diseases and the uh, important awards are Mozilio Schechter Award in 2022 from American Society of Microbiology, Haripada Kundarani Memorial Award for Lifetime Excellence in Professional Service from Medical College Calcutta in 2020, Bikeda Soration of Odisha Chapter in 2016, Young Mycologist Travel Award from International Society for Human and Animal Mycology in 1997, International uh, Scholarship Award of International Federation of Infection Control in 1994, and many more. Professor Chakravarti is a uh, member of expert bodies uh, all over the world, and he is member of 27 national and international uh, expert bodies. Important among them are he is president of International Society for Human and Animal Mycology from 2018 to 22, member of WHO expert group on priority fungal pathogens in 2020. So there is this is a vast list and I will not enumerate all the uh, names. He is member of 28 scientific societies and he is fellow of National Academy of Medical Sciences and he is he was president of Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists, Microbiologists in 2011 and 12. Sir is European Congress Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Disease Society member, International Society for Human and Animal Mycology. He is a member of that. He has been uh, president, president Indian Association of Medical Microbiology. Sir is on the editorial board of scientific journals and uh, he is editor of Medical Mycology from 2006 to 2018, associate editor Mycopathologia, deputy editor of Mycosis from 2012 till now, and editorial board member of Journal of Infections in Developing Countries from 2009 till now. He is editorial board member of Bulletin of Hapkin Institute from 2011 till now. Sir has guided at least six theses, including PhD thesis, MD thesis, and MSc in medical microbiology. Uh, he has uh, 460 publications, uh, research publications in various national and international journals of repute. And out of these, 373 are international publications and 87 national publications. Sir has delivered many lectures, orations, and <laughs> previously also. And uh, he has he is editor of two books, and he has 21 book chapters to his credit. So he has presented at least 375 papers in various national and international conferences, has delivered lectures at conferences, workshops, and CMEs. So with all these credits uh, to his career, I invite Professor Arunalok Chakravarti for today's oration. The title for his talk is, <laughs> title for his talk is Rhinosinusitis, Unraveling the Disease Spectrum. Sir, please. Thank you. I learned this first slide. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm really emotional because the crowds which I've seen just uh, one year back, they were my colleagues. Who's past slide? Well, last slide. Director just told me that my disappeared. I generally think that if we come after retirement without any particular activity which have been asked for, look at I generally try to avoid. But 
whenever I come, I generally spend around 30% time in Chandigarh. And my uh, drawing room, my wife has given me as an office. And all my people who require uh, collaboration, discussion, they come. We really have a very hard to work meeting. Of course, in library, uh, it is after effort. I'm not sure whether it was the previous director or present director that made the office. Uh, that office is for the retired faculty. They need not have to go to the uh, department because you may disturb somebody. That's a wonderful idea where you can call others. i thankful to Dr. Rana for making it functional. So I would say that next time onwards, as Dr. Bhaklal said, I'll try to come there and have not in my office. I, as a uh, speaking like director, Dr. Bivetlal, Dean Rakesh Sagal, my uh, esteemed friend, Dr. Panda from ENT, so my teachers, seniors, Professor S.K. Sharma, Professor Chawla, I'm really feeling emotional. Friends, Dr. Mehra, I still remember uh, in 19. 84, I've just seen him as a glimpse, not any idea. 1988, when I became faculty, I went along with Dr. P. Talwar to negotiate one equipment. And he was medical superintendent. And Dr. Talwar introduced me. He is the new faculty in biology. That time, my mind was whether I stay in fungus or going to the virus. It was going on. But Dr. Mehra was, first presence made me very, uh, really I would say that the person took the decision about the equipment. I explained why this equipment is required. After hearing me, he decided, and he said, just send, the, the, send me the specification, nothing else. And the equipment came after three, four months. I would say this type of person, it was really, Unbelievable. Till I used to see, whenever any oration or any program used to sit where Dr. Vivek Lal is sitting now, and really that's a wonderful person. So I'm starting with a pranam to Professor Mehra. The topic which I'm going to discuss is a very interesting one. Though I know my two non-doctors colleague is sitting here, I would say that you will be also getting some interest in it. Fungal rhinosinusitis unraveling the disease spectrum. What is rhinosinusitis? It is inflammation of the nose and sinuses. It really is a public health problem. You just see 16% of the US population, they sometimes suffer in their life. We are not very sure what is happening in India, but it's very important as well. We generally see two things, either acute rhinosinusitis or chronic. Acute means within four weeks, where virus, bacteria, they generally play a role in immunocompetent, whereas fungi are responsible in immunosuppressed. Now, the problem came in the chronic area. In the chronic area, which is more than 12 weeks, role of fungus became a debatable. Jens Ponicu, he is from Mayo Clinic. He suddenly uh, showed to the world that all chronic rhinosinusitis cases is because of fungi. That means around 1.4 billion people will suffer from fungal rhinosinusitis. But his opposers were also in USA. Brad Marple, he was from the Texas. He said a small proportion of CRS is due to fungi. You know, this has a lot of importance in case of pharmacy. Pharmacological companies were really debating on this issue very strongly, what should be done and not. Subacute from between 4 to 12 weeks, I would say this is sometimes as acute rhinosinusitis patient under treatment take a protracted course. So as the debate was going on, 
the American Academy of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and other related societies, they tried to develop a consensus. They said that specifically in the chronic group, we can divide it with polyp or without polyp. With polyp, it is a TH2 mechanism which should be there. And without polyp, it is the TH1 pathway which should be there. But friends, what it happened, uh, that slide is not coming. Uh, that is a very important slide. Uh, and that slide shows that we, uh, from our institute, developed a fungal rhinositis working group. And this working group brought international, all people came here. And those people, we sat in Mount View Hotel for two days. And this John James Ponicu, Brad Marple, everyone was there. And they ultimately developed a consensus definition, which I'll come later on. So this is the issues which had developed. Acute invasive means it is the most aggressive form of fungal emergency, which has been seen neutropenic patient. They develop it. And this is a rapid course. Extension to the orbit and brain happen. Aspergillus and mucorrhizal are main thing. This granulomatous variety, this has been seen mainly from India to Sudan. This area where this number of cases were seen. And these patients, they generally are immunocompatible. And here, Aspergillus flavors is the commonest region. And if you see, there's uh, high is really difficult to see. Until this, we have got pathologists from PGI who are so trained, they could not pick up this. It is inside the giant cell. Whereas chronic invasive variety, marked inflammatory cells with plenty of hyphae, mild immunosuppression in these patients, but this is worldwide. You can see plenty of hyphae which have been there. Fungal, so these are the invasive variety. We try to divide them invasive, non-invasive. So in non-invasive variety, fungal ball is unilaterally present maxillary sinus, well-defined, high attenuation mass, occasional flocculent calcium, reactive sclerosis, sinus swell, no invasion. This mass comes out like this in surgery. This is one of the photographs given to this during this workshop which you conducted in uh, Mount View Hotel. Now, this fungal ball is seen more in case of the France, in case of Taiwan. Of course, we also see, but not so many cases here. Here the problem starts. This is the allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. Initial definition by Bent and Kuhn has this five characters. Type 1 hypersensitivity, nasal polyposis, characteristic CT finding, allergic mucin, and this is the sarcoclein crystals. I could see that this is Dr. Ashim Das could identify it, there is presence of fungus. So I really it's very difficult. But this gens ponicu, he developed a stain which can easily pick up fungi. So that's a very interesting thing which happened. Now, this is the classification which I was trying to show you. Now, this classification, I have no time to discuss all these factors, but what I will try to do is that I'm going to discuss the acute invasive, especially in case of mucor, what happened, and regarding eosinophil-related fungal rhinosinusitis. Friends, concern for mucor mycosis in India is nothing new. We had already shown that 10 to 70 times mucormycosis in India compared to the Western world. But what happened during this COVID, it's just a tsunami. It's a storm which have been there. When government portal asked to, government asked to submit it uh, in their portal as a notifiable disease, within one and a half months, there were 50,000 cases. And the same portal mentions it is very likely that the actual figures are considerably higher than this. So 
why what happened it is not very clear so let's build up the story how we have looked at it friends in the beginning of 2020 we suddenly started seeing few more cases of mucormycosis then suddenly this report came from bangalore which showed that there is a series of 18 cases so my antenna went up i contacted my all colleagues in the world and asked them please collect the cases from 18 countries quickly 80 cases were collected and if you see majority were in india so we thought that we need a study and this study had been conducted during september to december at 16 centers in this country it was observed there is a twofold rise and it had been shown that in COVID-19, it is 0.27%, and in ICU, it is 1.6%. But most important thing is that diabetes is in two-thirds, and steroid had been one of the important factors. Now, one-third of the patient, there was no COVID, uh, no uh, diabetes, but in spite of that, they developed it. So that was in our mind. Most of the cases, were diagnosed when the patient were already discharged, 18 days. So they were coming from home. So those are the issues came to our mind. And if you see, mortality was very high. But what happened during this March to May or April, you see suddenly surge happened. Have you heard the eye specialities reported 3,000 cases? So, you know, India has got all experts. It's not the mycologist who need to be the expert or Dr. Vivek Lal in neurology to be the expert. It is the, all the people in other disciplines are expert. Some say it is because of the garbage around the hospital. Some say it is the makeshift COVID-19 facility which is important. Some say it is the contamination of the industrial oxygen. Humidifier contamination, these are the issues. Reused mask, gene supplementation, all these factors have been mentioned about this outbreak. But friends, what happened? I'll try to explain it. First, what we hypothesized. We felt during this second wave, so many patients came to the hospital that the doctors were seeing not only the patient in the hospital, also on the pavement. And they don't have the time how to control the comorbid factor. They were trying to save the patient. Then the oxygen supply was a really constrained. So they went on giving steroid. Instead of six milligram dexa, they have gone up to 30 to 40 milligram dexa. And instead of five to 10 days, they have gone up to one month, two months for this DEXA. Have you heard blood sugar of 900? Ask Dr. Pandla. There was a case, we are surprised that the blood sugar is 900. And mucor is coming down like this. This particular study from Mumbai has proven our, this hypothesis. This study was conducted in a tertiary hospital in Mumbai between March 20 to May 2021. This is in Fortis Hospital. They have more than 1,000 patients in ICU, and mostly all the patients were on steroid, and half of the patients were diabetic. What they controlled, they never exceeded the steroid dose, and the nurse-driven strict glycemic control they practiced. And in spite it is in Maharashtra, no case of mucormycosis was reported in that hospital. So this opened our mind further. So again, we conducted another study, 25 centers this time. More than nearly 2,000 camp cases and more, nearly 4,000 control. So here, other than diabetes and steroid, what we found is that rural residents and gene supplementation is also an important risk factor. There are multiple case control studies reported from India. 
I have just taken those who have at least 100 cases and controlled together. And if you see, all of them had shown the same finding, except someone has shown frequent nasal wash or cloth mask like this. Otherwise, the question was very simple, that there is diabetes and steroid, which is important. Now, what is happening in case of this hyperglycemia? In case of, you know, diabetes, even COVID-19 damaging the pancreas, third is steroid and stress. All these are increasing hyperglycemia, causing hyperglycemia, and this hyperglycemia ultimately leading to the hyperferritinemic syndrome, and this is causing reactive oxygen species release, free iron comes in the circulation. Along with it, our different autopsy series have shown that there is endothelitis which is being present. And this endothelitis, what it happened, GRP78 receptor, it is upregulated, and mucor has the cot H1 receptor, cot H receptor, which gets added, and from that it can enter. Again, one study done from PGI, and this study had shown that in case of this COVID-associated mucormycosis, GRP78 is really upregulated. So friends, this particular cartoon can explain you better because of high glucose, free iron, sidorophore, uh, decay condition, there is ER stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress. And that upregulates GRP78 where cortex 3 gets adhered and this ultimately takes the mucor inside the blood vessel causing the thrombus formation. So, this was the scenario. Scenario means at least diabetes steroid is very clear. But then what is about the environmental factor? Because so much hypothesis came. So we next look into this issue. We first again did a multicentric study. Manisha from our department led that study. And this study showed that neither oxygen, port oxygen, cylinder, humidifier, water in any of the hospital are contaminated with mucorals. These were all those people sitting and hypothesizing. What we found that the AC vents are contaminated and because of that, there is high mucoral spore count. But then people said, uh, there are so many cases who are treated at home and they also acquired mucor, and then they came to the hospital. So another study required that Anup Ghosh in our department, he went to all these places, and he found the 25 patients home who were not being treated in the hospital early. They were treated at home, but with mucor came to the hospital. So he collected the sample in the year, and you see, bedroom is very much contaminated. And what he found is that the, I'm sorry, uh, this is the rhizopus harigius, which was isolated from the environment and the clinical isolate, both of showing the same species. Then he did an AFLP, that is amplified fragment length polymorphism, to show the correlation, and showed that it is very much correlating with the bedroom isolates. So all these things had clearly, uh, confidently had showed that how this outbreak had happened. It was a more man-made, and when we trained the doctors, they really had stopped giving the excess steroid, and they started controlling the blood sugar. So that really helped in controlling the outbreak. But you know, some of the people who are in our eyes, and they are just trying to malign our country. I was hearing the story that the cow dung is a very important issue. We never ignored this aspect. But then when this paper came, this is Dimitrios Kontanis, is a very revered person for me. And he said that in this paper, mainly through the fumes generated from the burning of mucoral rich biomass, like cow dung and cup stubble, which is the main factor for this outbreak. Then our team again sat. We felt that 
now we have to do a study. So we did a study, and Kathibel from community medicine had gone. You can see we have collected air sample during burning of the cow dung, during, uh, before, during, and after. And also cultured the fresh and dried cattle dung, soil samples, and also the indoor air samples from the house with or without keeping cattle. What we found is that there's no difference. Then we found that even mucorals were found. These mucorals were not causing human infection at that time. And also, there is no difference in the samples from the houses with cattle or without cattle. And here also you see that the difference was not significant. So we said this, no significant increase in mucorals in the air during and after burning cow dung cake. And most common mucorals from soil is cow shed. Cow dung was Lictemia corombifera, whereas Rhizopus erigias was from the indoor air sample. So unlikely, the cattle dung burning contributes to the occurrence of mucormycosis. Friends, I presented this in the month of May in Washington in my oration uh, in American Society of Microbiology. Dimitrios Contanis was sitting there. He came out. I said, Urun, I never wanted. It is that the Indian lady was insistent. I don't know. How you put your name in it? And without knowing about it. This was a very serious thing I felt. ICMR did a very good study. They have shown that different COVID type has no relation with the COVID-associated mucormycosis. We now are working, this particular paper is almost under publication, where we try to see how COVID is changing our immunity. And this is the different patients group had been taken. You can see this is with COVID-19, this is with mucormycosis, this is with COVID-associated mucormycosis, and here we found there are several differential gene expression. And these are the factors which are governing the defined immunological parameters. I know this is a very specific area for discussion. This is a transcriptomyces assay. And what generally it had been found that it is profound intervascular coagulation and thrombotic change in case of COVID associated mucormycosis. Then Panda and his team has done another wonderful study. They found that, of course, the case numbers increase during this period, but at least they have shown the awareness increased so much that the people, they were already coming with a, which is not so severe, like vision loss, restricted extraocular movement, all these were seen in the pre-pandemic period. In the pre-pandemic period, it was less in number. So death rate was also low during this period of time. Sorry, again, another slide I could not show you. That particular slide is about, now I'm shifting to the chronic fungal rhinosensitis. You know, we had cases across India, but we were not having very good uh, data in the community. So we decided a study that we will go to the community. Dr. Panda had taken his uh, residence, and also Dr. Amarjit Singh from uh, community medicine helped us. We went the different uh, gurdwaras, and gurdwara people helped us in having a system where we could cover more than 100 million, 100,000 means more than a 1 lakh population could be surveyed. We found 8.1% of them is having fungal rhinosinusitis, sorry, chronic rhinosinusitis. And out of this, at least 8.1, that is of fungal rhinosinusitis. That means one in 1,000 in the Punjab villages who are having fungal rhinosinusitis. What is the reason? 
we are not yet completely, at least we show that the impact, that it is in one in thousand. When any person find a disease, one in hundred thousand, this becomes public health importance. And this is one in thousand. So this particular disease we, we collected spore, we found this is in the winter months, the spore count goes up. And most of the cases occur in the winter months. What happens in this winter months? You all know, this is the wheat thrashing season. And this wheat thrashing increases the spore, and that's why we see more of fungal rhinocerciitis. Dr. Ashim Dash and his team, we are also associated with it. We covered around 6, 665 rhinocerciitis cases. Histopathologically, you can see the characterization. Mostly, the patient have AFRS. Of course, you can see there are quite a number of cases of acute, chronic granulomatous also, very few chronic invasive, and fungal ball is only 3.9%. Some are having mixed infection. So here, the, what is the debate? Let me just, with a short form, try to say the debate. You know, allergic fungal rhinocytes, there is not a problem. People accept it. But you sort of have fungal rhinocytes there. Jens Poniku tried to say that all because of fungi. And he said that there should not be term allergic because atopy is not the factor. It is the eosinophil mucin which is being present. So accept it. It should be called as EFRS. We accepted, and he said that some of the people, when this fungus enters in the nose, with genetic susceptibility, they bring eosinophil there. And eosinophil has the major basic protein. That causes damages of the nasal epithelium. And because of that, there is secondary bacterial infection. But this madam uh, found another thing. Madam Ferguson, she found that there is another disease called eosinophilic mucin rhinocerciitis. There is eosinophilic mucin, but no fungus is there. What she tried to say is that you cannot use antifungal in this. This is systemic dysregulation. And then we also found in India, there are allergic fungal rhinocytes, which also goes in invasion. So this problem remained with us. At least we could resolve that allergy and eosinophil we can accept. But we cannot accept all chronic rhinocytes is because of fungi. So Dr. Pandas, another colleague, Dr. Sarvanan, uh, conducted this study. And this study, where he tried to see whether there is any difference between EMRS and this group of AFRS. What he found, there is no significant difference. So we think the whole issue is too much uh, you are dissecting out. Major issue, which is of TH2, which I'm going to come. You see, in USA, it had been found that mostly their cases are because of alternaria. And they have shown that there is allergy to alternaria, which is significant, not with aspergillus. But in India, we have got aspergillus and we have hardly anything in dematicious fungi. So in case of the, uh, when they have shown this study, one of my uh, MD student, she conducted a very good study. She conducted Pratibha Kale, she is now in Delhi. She showed that our major basic protein is more in response to aspergillus flavors rather than alternative alternative, which is seen in case of the Western world. So friends, what I'm trying to say is that all this is the, really the way TH2 is being stimulated. You see, sinonasal mucosa serves as a physical barrier. But epithelial dysfunction leads to chronic stimulation of adaptive immune response. And fungi are essential component of the sinonasal microbe. The protease in fungi is very important that degrade the epithelial tight junction, 
and that is helping ultimately the receptors which are their TLRs and other uh, CLRs and the other fungal component, they are also playing an important role in causing this disease. So TLRs, CLRs, all these ultimately I am not because uh, you all are not immunologists. Uh, those who are immunologists would have more interest in this area. But just think about this is a TH2 response. Now, eosinophil is also very important here. Basically, eosinophil prevents tissue invasion, also contributes in the patholo immunopathology of inflammation. Pro-inflammatory proteins already I've mentioned, these are important. And here, what is being seen is that uh, there is extracellular trap which have been playing a role in this. And this has been already shown in case of ABPA, which we need to show in case of chronic fungal rhinosinusitis. So there is a similarity between AFRS and ABPA. A lot of similarities are there. And even it had shown that some of the patients who are ABPA, the later part they develop the AFRS. It has been shown by Dr. Shah from uh, Delhi around 23% patient, they have got chronic rhinosinusitis when they have ABPA, and nine agreed for surgery, seven confirmed the same thing. Even Ritesh had shown one of the patient that presented with ABPA was diagnosed AFRS one year later. Friends, what is happening here? In both this, AFRS and ABPA, whole genome sequencing is now giving us more insight in it. There is a, because of some change, there is loss of diversity. And loss of diversity increases the Asperger's flavors and fumigators in it. And this higher presence within this inflammatory pulmonary sinus cavities are the main responsible factor. So Dr. Ritesh was invited in a uh, advances in Asperger's meeting. We are together there. And there are these hypotheses which we have put together that fungal spores become trapped in the yarrow mucus, causing fungal sensitization. Spore germinates into hyphae. In a genetic susceptibility population, TH2 is the main important response. Fungal specific Ig and total Ig production, mast cell degradation, late phase allergic inflammation. Finally, eosinophil attack the hyphae degranulate and release inflammatory mediator, and AFRS and ABPA, then it is causing because of it. Life is not simple. Bacteriologists came. They said, whole chronic rhinosinusitis is because of bacteria, not of fungus. So you can see they also came with this staff or your super antigen, which have got several of these factors. So whenever there is something we have to do some study in it. You know, in case of super antigen staph aureus, it causes immune dysfunction, it causes epithelial barrier dysfunction, cause biofilm formation. And we found in case of the chronic rhinosinusitis, there is polymicrobial biofilm formation which is there. So one of my PhD had completed this study in this area. It's an extensive work. In two slides, I'd like to sum up his work. What he's shown is that in case of human nasal epithelial cell expresses all these pattern recognition receptor. And if levels has high allergenicity potential than alternia alternator, enterotoxin can also induce the same response. So this is the hypothesis which we have made that after this nasal epithelial activation, and M2 macrophages, finally, this TRC, that is the CCL17 uh, cytokine, ultimately TH0 cells turn into TH2. And TH2 ultimately causing this chronic eosinophilic inflammation. Friends, this is my end of talk. I'm just trying to say is that there are certain future aspects which you need to carry on. That's very important. One is, what are the important epithelial cell receptors for cytokine release? Is this inter interaction is specific, species specific? 
Are TAs too important for maintaining the chronicity? Is there any redundancy in the pathway? Or is the crosstalk between the pathway that amplifies the TAs2 inflammatory response? Understanding the molecular environment in the sinuses and lower airway, that would be very important. How the immune response differs at different stages of fungal life cycle? What are the effects of eosinophil? Because eosinophil is very little studied. You please carry on. But I would request if anyone can develop a mouse model of fungus related sinusitis, that will be greatly needed to better elucidate the role of fungi. So this is just what we have seen, the summary, what I have tried to explain to you. I was thinking, shall I make a slide of acknowledgement? Because so many people helped me, so many. In the, I was thinking if I name somebody will say my name was not there. I helped you. At least I have no problem with the international collaborators. There are so many of them. But I would say ENT department, medical microbiology, pulmonary medicine, histopathology, community medicine, radiology, biochemistry, my students, and many other multicentric study which you have conducted. With this, I thank you for your great attention. Neurology is missing. <laughs> huh? Neurology is missing. Neurology, fungal rhinosinusitis is missing. Fungus, but both logs have helped. Neurosurgery is missing. Neurology is missing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for taking us in the world of fungus and fungi, and especially talking about mucormycosis, uh, which created havoc in the second uh, wave of uh, pandemic of the COVID. Uh, now time for some honor. Uh, I'll request Professor Satyavati and Professor Vik to uh, assist in honoring uh, Professor Anulokit Chakravarti. May I request our director, sir, to honor Dr. Chakravarti with a moment. I'll request uh, Professor Rijanita and Professor Anurag uh, to present this scroll. Uh, I'll request our Dean, Professor Rakesh Hegel, to please present uh, Dr. Chakravarti with this scroll. Sir. Sir, sir. One thing I just uh, forgot to mention, uh, you know, my name is Oruna Lok Chakravarti. I feel so bad. Bengali mein rasgulla khane ka chakkar mein, they never K at this end. So it's the Oruna Lok. I hope it's, he was not there, but it was put by my parents. So I had to keep it. Internationally, I tried to make them say Orun. Somebody says Oruna, Oruna is a female. So I really face a lot of difficulty with my name. I am even my director calling Oruna Loke. I am not Oruna Lok Chakrut. <laughs> I'll request uh, our Dean sir to propose a vote of thanks. A very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, Professor Lal, Director PGI. Uh, Professor Sharma, ex-director PGI. Dr. Bera, then I see Madam, Sir, and uh, uh, our DDA, FA. Uh, it's uh, really an honor to propose a vote of thanks today. Well, Arunalok, uh, I have known him since uh, 1983. I joined uh, PJ in 1982 and he joined in 1983. 
So we have been together since then. And when we joined the department, well, uh, the three departments were, were already there, parastology, virology, and medical microbiology. And most of the time, they were at loggerheads. But now, when we uh, were there together, surprisingly, we were never at loggerhead. Probably, I didn't interfere in his work, and neither he interfered in his work. The reason was actually I couldn't remember. Uh, I didn't enter mycology was because I, the names were a bit difficult. The fungus, it was difficult to remember. So I, I told him that is why I didn't enter into your field. Otherwise, maybe I would have poked my nose into it and maybe got rhinosinusitis. So, <laughs> and uh, it has been a very, very long journey of around, say, 39 to 40 years since we have known each other. And we are the best of friends. And uh, I congratulate uh, Arun Lok here, not Loke, obviously, <laughs> Arun Lok that he has done, I mean, it's pioneering work he has done and I am really obliged to him that he has come here and also told you what work. This is just a minuscule amount of work actually they have done and his team has done. So I am really grateful to all of you who have come here, the dignity, uh, dignities also and also all the staff who has attended, I see a lot of attendance also, and it is really good of all of you to come and listen to his talk. And I hope you have gained a lot of uh, some uh, knowledge about mycology because mycology is a part of a life and this has come to stay. And it is going to be sort of all fungal infections were increasing. At when I, we were residents, when we joined together, Mycology was really limited to some uh, extent. Only Dr. Talwar, uh, Dr. Pushpa Talwar is the one who was doing some work on that. And uh, I am also thankful to all of the organizers. Dr. Panda is there also, whom I know him since long. And lastly, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Dr. Mehra, I know him, I knew him personally also, and I can tell you he was one of the I mean, very spokespoken, and he's told that hard taskmaster, but very, I know him very well, he's very soft-spoken, very helping. Anytime you go to him, he would help in any work, say inpatient or anything. And I still remember uh, meeting him a, num a lot of number of times in this hall also and otherwise also. And it is an honor to be here in his remembrance also that uh, we are remembering such a, uh, I mean, um, a person uh, every year. And, uh, uh, and I'm also grateful to all of uh, the people who have organized and helped in uh, making this uh, function a great success. Thank you very much. Uh, I would request all of you to join us for high.